All right, welcome everybody. Thanks so much for joining us. This is investing in wholesale properties with your self-directed IRA or 401k. My name is Sean McKay, and this is an American IRA presentation. And so today what we're gonna discuss is the idea of using your IRA or 401k to actually be a wholesaler. So you're doing transactional deals and uh, we'll, we'll kind of dig into what that looks like and how that plays out. Uh, but please keep in mind, as is with any of the strategies with your self-directed account, you want to make sure that you're heavily leaning on your professionals, your, your CPAs, your attorneys to give you guidance. But we do find, especially on these kind of transactional activities, that uh, we have kind of a wide range of preferences, of perspectives, especially from CPAs as it pertains to how this works uh, in terms of prohibited transactions, disqualified persons, et cetera, et cetera. So again, this is an example of what we've seen from uh, some of our clients in terms of how they can utilize their retirement account, but we're not blessing this as appropriate for everyone's account and for everyone's uh, situation. So uh, hopefully there's some value in there for you today. So at American IRA, we are one of the few fully integrated self-directed IRA and 401k providers. And so what that means is we have the same ownership group for American IRA, which is the record keeper, that's the administrator for your retirement account, as we do for the parent trust company, which is New Vision Trust Company. They are the custodian. They are the firm that essentially allows a self-directed IRA provider to be in business. So we were founded in 2004 by Jim Hitt. He's currently our CEO. And ultimately, we have a unique business model in the self-directed space. Because we're one of the few fully integrated providers, that allows us to get real-time information from state and national regulators as it pertains to what they want to see from these retirement accounts different rules that are coming down the line. And so it makes us a more informed staff, which makes you a more informed client. So we have a really unique position in this space. Also, as you look at our business model, what you find is that our fees are exceptional. So typically what you see in the self-directed arena is that the annual fee is either based on the size of the account. So that's the top half of this chart or the annual fee is based on the number of assets that that self-directed provider is the custodian for. And so in both of those scenarios, really, you can see that very quickly, these self-directed accounts can become very, very expensive. So with the account value size, really what that firm is telling you is as a client, as you do a good job, because again, these are self-directed accounts, as you do a good job uh, growing these accounts, we're going to get to charge you more money each year. The second line item is as you save up money, as you grow your account and you're accumulating more assets, more properties, for example, we get to charge you more a year for acquiring those additional assets. So our premise at American IRA is that that's really not a fair way to do record keeping for retirement accounts. Uh, we should get kind of a very minimal annual fee uh, for the, frankly, minimal value that a self-directed provider can add to the growth of your retirement account. Now, of course, with these educational platforms, we, we try to be as valuable as possible to kind of the, the ways to think about investing and how you can utilize your IRA or 401k, uh, but by no means are we uh, vetting opportunities for you, nor is any self-directed provider. So at the end of the day, our fees are exceptionally low, and that's a huge cost savings for you as the client. Now, in addition to the great fees, we're very, very lucky to have such a strong team. The operations team for a self-directed provider is really the backbone that allows the clients and for the firm to be successful. And so regardless of the platform that you look at online, whether it's Better Business Bureau, Google Reviews, Yelp, et cetera, you're going to find that not only are we highly rated, but we have a volume of reviews as well. And so I think that really speaks to, again, the phenomenal job that our operations team does in terms of servicing these accounts. So if there are any of you that are listening that have ever uh, taken time out of your day to leave us a review, we really appreciate that. And that certainly has helped us to grow. 
So as we dig into it today, we talk about the idea of wholesaling. Uh, so ultimately, when we think about these transactional activities, sometimes there's a little bit of confusion in the, the language that should be used. And ultimately, with wholesaling, I think that's kind of become kind of a, a catch-all, if you will, for uh, transactional real estate activities. And so if you could just stay with me for a moment as we really kind of uh, rethink the terminology around doing these transactional deals. And so for me, the idea of wholesaling really should originate with the property having an option on it. So we're, we're going to talk about options on real estate deals. And so with an option, what we're saying is that if our retirement account is going to go under contract with an individual or a company that currently owns a property, our retirement account is putting an option on the property. So our retirement account has the right, but not the obligation to purchase a certain asset, such as a property at a certain price over a certain period of time. And so if your retirement account does not exercise that option, if you will, then the retirement account will lose the option consideration. And so that is the money that the retirement account has put in place with that seller to say, hey, I am really wanting to move forward with this deal. So this is the skin in the game that my retirement account is willing to put into this transaction. And so an example could be Jeff's IRA has an option on a house for $140,000 until October 1st of 2021. So that is the length of time and that is the agreed upon price that Jeff's IRA would be able to purchase the property from the current seller of that asset. And so as we think about options, in terms of having an option on a property, that allows us to have a number of different, what we would consider exit strategies or ways to move forward with that real estate transaction. And so with that option, Jeff's IRA would have, if uh, this is in real time, so we're, we're maybe a third of the way through September, that gives Jeff's IRA a few weeks to do any of these options. So Jeff's IRA could purchase the property and just simply keep it as a rental based on that option. Uh, Jeff's IRA could decide to purchase the property, fix that property up by paying third party individuals and entities, essentially non-disqualified parties to uh, repair that property, fix it up, and then turn around and sell that property, uh, presumably on the retail market to somebody who might want to live in the property. Or Jeff's IRA could decide to assign that contract. And that's typically, that's, that's really the meat of the wholesaling activity where the retirement account is not actually going to purchase the property, it's going to sell the contract or assign that contract to another investor. And that, that end investor, if you will, will actually close on the property. So if we think about it this way, the, the original seller is A, the investor, in this case, Jeff's IRA is B, and then the end buyer of the property is C. So C is going to, purchase the property technically from A, the seller, and then Jeff's IRA will essentially get a fee associated with selling that contract. Now, the other option is for the retirement account for Jeff's IRA to purchase that property and do essentially a double closing where the IRA, if it does not have enough money to purchase the property, outright, it can actually borrow some temporary funds, what we call transactional funding, and then turn around with the same closing attorney or escrow office, immediately sell that property to that end buyer of the property. So, the, so there's an AB closing, so between the seller and Jeff's IRA, and then at the same table, Jeff's IRA can turn around, do a BC closing. So B uh, the IRA sells to the end buyer for that property who may go on to make it a rental property or do a fix and flip themselves. So again, it, it all starts with the idea of having an option on a property. And one of the outcomes is that the retirement account can wholesale that property 
and make a spread selling it to another investor. So a lot of times when we see clients utilize this strategy, it can be because they are looking to grow what, what could be a smaller retirement account. So Jeff's IRA might put $1,000 in option consideration, kind of that skin in the game with that seller. Um, so that $1,000 could turn into 5,000 or 10,000 or more in terms of the wholesale fee that it could get from wholesaling that property to an end investor who's going to make it a rental, make it a fix and flip, whatever the case may be there. So then we dig into wholesaling. So really, again, so these are kind of my personal definitions, but as we think about wholesaling, that's the act of putting a property under contract and then assigning or selling the right to that contract to another investor. Now, again, this, this is a strategy we can utilize with smaller retirement accounts, but the wholesaling can only come about because we have the option on the property. So the option kind of gets the retirement account into the investment and wholesaling might be one of the ways that the retirement account can profit from making the investment. And so what's critical when you're putting an option on a property, but especially if you're going to wholesale this property, you're going to sell this contract to another investor, is that the IRA or 401k must put the property under contract. Many times what we'll see is that clients who are very active in the real estate investing community, they might want to put a property under contract in their personal name or in one of their companies, their LLCs, and then somehow get that asset into their retirement account so it can then be wholesaled. The retirement account must go under contract with that seller. And then ideally you're gonna probably use some sort of legal language. Of course, you wanna discuss this with your, your attorney, but some sort of language around and or assigns after the retirement account is put under contract so that it, it articulates that the retirement account or anybody else with and or assigns can, can assign or sell that contract to another investor. It's also critical that the retirement account must have skin in the game. So it has to have some sort of earnest money or option consideration uh, for this contract to be binding and for it to be compliant uh, per the governing bodies, the IRS, Department of Labor, et cetera. They do not want to see an infinite rate of return. So again, uh, sometimes in the real estate community, you can put a property under contract and you don't have to put any money or consideration down with the seller. With retirement accounts, um, it's not appropriate for zero money to be turned into tens of thousands of dollars plus. So the retirement account must have some sort of initial uh, consideration or skin in the game there. And so again, keep in mind, it is the retirement account that is controlling this deal. It, the retirement account put the property under contract. The retirement account is either making it a rental, a fix and flip, or wholesaling that property but the funds will flow from the retirement account to the, the house or the closing, if you will. And then ultimately whatever profit is yielded from this deal, that flows back to the retirement account. So as we think about strategies for acquisitions, this is really the scenario for any investments that our clients can make. So this is true for rentals, for fix and flips, and certainly for doing options or wholesaling properties. So option one is where the retirement account is going to be the sole entity going under contract with the seller. And then ultimately it's going to uh, essentially pay cash for the, the earnest money, the option consideration. So just a very straightforward transaction, one owner, and we'll assume there's no leverage being used here. Option number two is where the retirement account is actually going to partner with somebody else, we'll say to do a wholesale deal. So sometimes clients will work with their tax and legal professionals and they will have their retirement account partner with their, their personal name or their company and they will both get to benefit from that wholesale deal. So let's say the seller is requiring that the, the, uh, the contract is written so that there is a thousand dollars of uh, option consideration or earnest money with that seller. And so what may happen is that investor might say, you know, I'd like for my retirement account to get the bulk 
of the profit from this deal. So maybe the retirement account will own, let's say 80% of the deal. And then their company, their LLC owns 20% of the deal. So the retirement account will put up 80% of that thousand dollars. So $800, the LLC will put up the $200, the 20% for this deal. And so if that, that wholesale deal yields, let's say a $10,000 profit, then 8,000 flows back to the retirement account and 10,000 flows back to their LLC. And then the third option is where a retirement account can use leverage to do a real estate deal. So an example of that could be that the retirement account decides to do the double closing that we spoke about. So the retirement account will actually need to close and purchase the property from the seller. And it may have its own cash, but it may have to use leverage. So it could use something like short-term funding, like the transactional funding that we spoke about. That transactional funding is, is essentially money from a third party. A, it must be non-recourse, and B, it must be from a non-disqualified person. We have a lot of content if you're unfamiliar with that, but that's basically the account holder, their spouse, their lineal family members, as well as entities that they own or control. And so in that scenario, the retirement account temporarily borrows money, turns around and sells the property to another investor in the double closing, and that spread in profit will flow back to the retirement account. Again, I can't say this enough, so critical when you're thinking about these different transactional strategies, when you're thinking about leverage, please speak with your tax and legal professionals to get guidance on all of those potential ramifications and how that can play out for your retirement account. So now we're going to go into a, a example of a wholesale deal. So I call this relationship brandy. So there are so many full-time real estate entrepreneurs out there that they spend their life just uh, creating and cultivating relationships with other uh, real estate investors, with homeowners. And so uh, if you're in the real estate space, everyone knows at least a few relationship brandies. They're just uh, people that uh, usually are likable, they get along with everyone, they kind of know what's going on in their neighborhoods. And so in this case, um, you know, sometimes Randy will acquire rental properties, sometimes he does fix and flips, and then other times he's very short term transactional, and he'll do a wholesale deal. So again, keep in mind, if it's going to be a wholesale deal, relationship Randy's IRA will go under contract, the earnest money comes from his account and he needs to have the proper vesting on the agreement with the seller. So that's New Vision Trust Custodian, FBO meaning for benefit of, we'll say Randy Smith's IRA, for example. So in this deal, Randy's speaking with this, this uh, landlord, he's getting out of the rental property game and he's looking ideally to sell what's left of his portfolio just to one buyer, just to make it very easy and clean. And so Randy puts 20 units under contract. So it could be 20 single family houses. It could be 10 duplexes, five quads, whatever it may be, puts the, the group of properties together and the average property unit is put under contract for $80,000. And currently as is condition, it's worth about $100,000. So uh, the, the burnt out landlord, he's taking a little bit of a discount just to kind of move on with his life. Randy decides to mark each property up $8,000. So the person buying the properties, their basis will be $88,000. So the, the $80,000 plus the eight. So each property goes under contract uh, from relationship between the seller and relationship Randy. Relationship Randy's IRA uh, puts $1,000 in option consideration with the seller for each of those units. So a total of $20,000. And then there will be a cash buyer that comes along to purchase the portfolio via an assignment. So what that means is this is all gonna be done in one closing, it won't be separate closings. So the entire package was put under contract for 1.6 million. And then the assignment price to this end buyer, it could be just a regional hedge fund buying portfolios of properties, is going to buy that portfolio from Randy's IRA for $1,760,000. The buyers and the, the original seller will have to kind of split the closing costs associated with that, that transaction. So Randy's IRA will actually profit the full, 
profit, the difference between the assignment price and what it went under contract for. So in this case, $160,000. Now, again, I can tell you, especially in this market uh, with so much institutional money out there, uh, this is happening on a regular basis. So you can wholesale a single property. You could wholesale a bundle of properties, in this case, 20 units. We see apartment complexes wholesale. There's, there's a huge range and scale of what you can wholesale inside or outside of your retirement account. And so in this example, uh, we'll go through a partnering scenario. So this is more than one entity, if you will, that is going to be essentially wholesaling a deal. So in this deal, the land, so this was a land deal. This actually happened uh, to one of our clients uh, close to our headquarters. The land deal is worth uh, 1.5 million. Now, this was an estate situation. There were a lot of errors. There were a lot of uh, challenges in terms of trying to get everyone on the same page. And so ultimately they decided to just simply sell the land. Uh, in retrospect, it didn't look like they got the best advice in terms of value and uh, what the asset was worth, but they were willing to sell the land for $800,000, so uh, close to a 50% discount there. And so in order to do this deal, the earnest money needed to be uh, $50,000 to put this property under contract. Our client only had $32,000 in their retirement account. So the client decided to bring on a money partner to partner on this deal to provide a portion of that needed $50,000 to put the property under contract. They decided to split the profit and assign the land to a builder. So again, one transaction, but it's going to be uh, a group of heirs, this, uh, these two investors that are then going to get the property under contract for 800, and then they're going to sell that, that in this case, dirt to a builder. So our IRA uh, client put $10,000 into the deal. The money partner put $40,000 into the deal. They sold the land to a builder, also at a little bit of a discount at 1.1. So the, the gross profit was $300,000. And again, that was split between the two partners. So that, that might be a little bit confusing on face value for some of you looking at this because they didn't put in the two wholesaling partners the same amount of money, but they split the profit evenly. The key here is that they were non-disqualified parties from each other. So again, back to the example we used on the acquisition slide, if the IRA was partnering with a disqualified person, such as the account holder, the amount of money would need to be proportionate to the ownership, to the profit, the whole, the whole shebang. But if it is with a non-disqualified partner, you can actually split the, prop, uh, split the profit, split the ownership uh, disproportionately to the capital that is being brought to that deal. So just a little tidbit there. Again, always talk to your tax and legal professionals uh, but we've seen that blessed by those professionals uh, a significant amount of times over the years. So as you're looking at just how you interact with your retirement account, how you can be successful at doing these deals, the critical thing is to do things in the right order. So first and foremost, you need to open and fund your self-directed account. Then you go out there hunting for the deals and the opportunities so that ultimately American IRA, the operations team that I spoke so highly of can assist you with the paperwork so that your retirement account can wholesale the property, can buy a rental property, can be a private lender for other investors, whatever you deem to be appropriate there. Again, I'm Sean McKay with American IRA. My email is sean, S-E-A-N, at AmericanIRA.com. The website is AmericanIRA.com. The phone number is 828-257-4949 or toll-free 866-7500-IRA, which is 472. All right, great. Well, thank you all so much. I hope you have a great day.